Hey guys, it's Doug. If you were asked to integrate two software applications, but the messages could not be lost, and the servers couldn't know that each other exist, how would you do it? And the answer is not HTTP. To me, this sounds like a job for a JMSQ. JMS stands for Java Messaging Service, but the latest version is called the Jakarta API. Believe it or not, you don't actually have to use Java in order to use the Java Messaging Service. It just got that name because it was originally created by Sun Microsystems, who also created Java. JMS can be implemented as either a queue or a topic, but today we're just going to be focusing on the queue. The other will be a topic for another video. Before we start talking about what a JMS queue is, if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button, consider subscribing and sharing the video. Thanks, and let's get back in line. For those of you already familiar with data structures, a JMS queue is just like an in-memory queue, except it's hosted externally, and it's used to connect applications instead of connecting classes in a single application. If you haven't experienced data structures or queues yet, don't worry about it. Here's a quick explanation. The simplest way to think about a queue is that it's a structure where things are pushed into it, single file, and then they're accessed on the other side of the queue in the same order that they were pushed in. You can also think of a queue like a grocery line. If you're standing in line, you're single file and you're in the queue, and you get pulled out of the queue as soon as you start actually checking out your items with the cashier. Messages that go over the JMS protocol have three main parts, and these are really similar to the main parts that you've probably seen in other protocols. You have the headers, the properties, and you also have the body. Now the headers in this scenario are specific headers that only JMS uses. An example of this would be the JMS reply to, the JMS correlation ID, or the JMS timestamp. These are things that JMS uses in order to have some metadata about the message. The properties are where you can actually set custom values similar to what you would do with HTTP headers. For example, you might put something like an API key or an authentication token inside of the properties. And the body, just like you might have expected, is the main payload of the JMS message. Usually it's going to be text or JSON, but JMS does support multiple data types. When implementing a JMS queue, it can be set up with TLS encryption for a secure connection when sending data. It can also be configured as durable. When it comes to software architecture, durable just means that if the server that the JMS queue is on goes down, that those messages are not lost. The way that it does this is that it actually saves all the messages as soon as they come into the queue, it also writes them to the file and they stay on that file until they leave the queue. So what ends up happening is if the JMS queue goes down, when it comes back up, the very first thing that it does is it checks the file to see if it has any data that it needs to recover back into the queue. That's not something you get with a regular HTTP connection, and that's exactly why so many enterprise applications and microservice architectures use JMS to wire together all the different pieces. Take a look at this comparison chart that I put together to compare HTTP topics and queues to one another. Benefits of a queue over HTTP are durability, and the ability to buffer data. However, HTTP is much lighter weight because it doesn't require additional technology to get added into your stack. Most mature projects already have an HTTP server and client baked into the project. This means if you're just working on some weekend project, it's okay to just use HTTP. But if you're working on some type of enterprise application in a production environment where messages cannot be lost, then you should really consider using a JMS queue instead. A queue is usually set up with three different configurations. The first one is the push-pull method. In the push-pull method, there are one or more applications shoving data into a queue, and one or more applications are consuming from the queue, but each consumer gets a unique message. It doesn't send the same message to all the different consumers. Push-pull is frequently used with very high-speed messages that are not expecting any response. Usually those are called fire and forget messages. The second way that a JMS queue is usually configured is as a request reply. This is where one application, let's call it app one, pushes data into a queue, but it also wants a response back, just like an HTTP request. It will publish data, but it will also start consuming from a separate queue. App two will consume the data from the first queue, process it, and then push the result into the queue that app one is consuming from. This essentially copies the way that HTTP allows you to send a request and get a response. The last way that JMS queues are usually configured 
can actually be applied to both push-pull and request reply JMS queues. This type of configuration is called an exclusive pair. An exclusive pair just means that only one publisher or one subscriber can be on either end of the queue. By having a single publisher and a single subscriber on a queue, it greatly increases the security of the message transfer, and it also reduces the ability for a message to get processed out of turn. Now, as you might have thought, we don't need to implement JMS from scratch. There are implementations already done that we can use. My favorite is called RabbitMQ. I like this one because it's high speed, it's very flexible, and it has a great admin dashboard for seeing all the stats about what's happening. This includes things like how fast things are going through the queue, how fast things are being acknowledged, and whether or not things are actually getting delivered. The second implementation that I would use is called ActiveMQ. This is an Apache project with a huge community and a ton of examples. And lastly, if you're more into cloud native solutions where you don't have to actually start anything in your code, but you just want to use a hosted JMS queue, you can use something like Amazon SQS or IBM MQ. The benefit of using a hosted queue is that you don't actually have to set it up on your development PC or on your own server. It runs in the cloud, so you just send messages to the cloud server and then you consume them in your other application. I hope that this video gave you at least a surface level understanding of JMS queues and got you you excited to use JMS in one of your upcoming projects. Stick around for a continuation of this series where I'll also talk about how topics compare to queues and HTTP. Thanks for watching, happy coding, and I'll see you in the next one.